demystifying AI. I propose this topic because I think there's a lot of confusion about what AI is, um, what threats it poses um, and how it can be used. I very strong belief, as I have with just every technological wave that's kind of come along in the last um, 50 years, that there's a lot of power in it to make workplaces more efficient, more effective, as well as healthier and safer. However, as with any tool, we cannot assume that people will use it well. Um, people will always find ways of abusing a tool. Um, so we need to really think very carefully about how we use these tools. To do that, we have to understand them better. Um, now, the very fact that you're here today shows me that you're not the, the, the people who are putting their head in the sand and hoping AI will go away, which um, I have come across that amongst some health and safety professionals. I think it's a shame. Um, and I was really interested to see what Richard Jones, um, former IOSH head of policy, said in the, the last edition of IOSH magazine. So it really chimed in with a sort of call for why we need events like this today and why it's so important that you've all made the time to come. Um, and he says very clearly here, Organisations need professionals who can champion ethical practice and are able to provide OSH advice on topics. And he include wearables, VR, AR, analytics and drones and so on. But he also specifically included artificial intelligence. Now, you know, we know about ethics. We champion ethics. That's kind of why a lot of us went into health and safety, because we want to make the world a safer place. However, if we don't understand the technology, if we don't make an effort to become AI literate, we won't be able to champion that ethical advice that's needed. Um, IBM recently had a report and, and what they were saying was artificial intelligence won't replace people, but people who understand and can use AI will replace people who can't understand and use AI, which is why it's so important we keep ourselves up to date. Now, I'm not going to spend a long time talking about um, explaining what AI is, because I want us to spend the time today showing rather than telling you, which is why the demonstrations um, that were coming up shortly are so important. But I did think we just needed to make this very clear distinction um, between general AI, which is the stuff that we see in films. It's the robots, the androids, the C-3PO, Ava, in X Machina and so on. Um, it can respond to any questions on any topic and sort of behaves in a very humanoid way. Personally, I well, it's certainly it's certainly true that it doesn't exist yet, and I don't think it ever will. And a lot of experts don't think that we will ever get that form of general AI. This is the kind of prosaic state of AI in my house, you know. So we have the uh, an Alexa in the corner of the living room, um, and we've and I've got a rumba upstairs in the bedroom, um, which kind of moves around the bedrooms as the week goes on. Um, Alexa can't clean my floor and my Roomba robot vacuum cleaner can't play music. So it's very narrow. They have very specific jobs that they do um, to achieve particular goals. Now, you might sort of think, well, I, I haven't got tools like that in my house. I, I, I don't want um, Alexa or, or any of these other um, speakers spying on me. Um, I don't, I'm quite happy to use a vacuum cleaner rather than leave it to a robot. But we are exposed to AI in other ways. If you have a Netflix account, you will get things like this because you watch this thing. Maybe you want to watch this other thing. Um, you, you get this in, uh, in Amazon as well. You bought this. You might want to buy that. Um, every time you use Google Translate. Now, you might think that Google Translate is simply looking up in a dictionary um, one word against another. But it's a much more complex mapping sort of networking than that. So Google Translate is using AI as well to provide those translations. Um, this is the thing that I find most amazing on my phone. I'm trying to find a photograph and I can say, right, show me all the photographs on my phone of a bridge um, or of a, even down to a certain person. So all of that is narrow AI, but each of those can only do one thing. Um, the other distinction I wanted to make was I think we've got this notion that AI at the moment is all about chat GPT and BARD um, and, and similar um, generative AI. But a few years ago, we were talking about the machine learning type AI. We were talking about the, the very clever chess programs. And then we had um, AlphaGo. Um, and these are very different types of AI. Now, I'm not going to get again, I'm not going to go into the technical differences in a lot of detail today because um, I know a lot of you just want to see what it can do rather than, than think about the differences. But I've tried to just summarize on that slide um, what those differences are. I think this last section here, the uses, is the interesting part for me. So the generative stuff 
is actually quite useful for generating virtual training simulation scenarios for drills. So things that are not necessarily based in truth, but are a little bit more um, imaginative, whereas the machine learning, the predictive maintenance, the, the, the improving the controls that we need. So the much more factual based stuff. Now, the presenters today might disagree with my sort of interpretation of it, but that's certainly how I see it. The, the generative stuff to me is still too much in the realms of um, guessing. Um, whereas the machine learning, I think, is is has more, um, and and sometimes that's what you want. But with machine learning, I think we've we've got more scope in that area. But as you can see, both of them can be useful in health and safety. Um, now, one of the things I want you to think about as we go through today is to think about this idea of challenges and opportunities. Um, and you know, every technology that we've had. Um, has has had both, hasn't it, when you think about it? So the opportunities, I think, are what AI can do with information. We are overwhelmed with information these days, with documentation, um, with and, and actually, you know, it's not paper documentation anymore, it's online, but that leads to a greater and greater proliferation of, of documents. Um, and having something that can sift through all of that and help us is, is really necessary. It can help us with stuff with with the cameras because we've got more cameras around. How do we make use of that data that we can get from the from the visual image? Um, the last one we won't be talking about today, which is robots. But obviously, using AI with robots can also replace a lot of the dangerous, dirty, and, and heavy work. And if robots is something people members want to talk about, we could maybe have another meeting another time where we discuss that in more detail. But these are the two really that we'll be thinking a bit more about today. Challenges, again, we could have an entire session on these, but I think these are the sort of headline challenges we ought to be thinking about. Um, and again, I'm not going to cover them in a lot of detail at this point. Um, but I just, again, want to ask that question. Um, and this is a really easy comparison, but, you know, nuclear power, when we when that came up, it's like, well, the best thing we could do with it, we could have made clean energy, we could have got rid of coal 50 years ago and not have caused all the sort of damage to our planet. This is the Hiroshima monument. You know, we know what the worst of nuclear is. Um, more prosaic, more recent example of dating apps. Um, now, my old university friend spent her adult life looking after her elderly mother and rearing sheep. Uh, didn't have many opportunities to meet the man of her dreams. Um, she met Robin. Um, neither of them had married. They were in their late 40s when they got married. They're now approaching their 10th wedding anniversary. They're still really happy together. So, you know, dating apps, great. But we also know about all of the scams um, where people have lost money and, and remortgaged their house and, and you know, all sorts of tragic events as a result of, of the dating apps. So as we go through the talks today, I want you to really think about both sides. I want you to think, this is great. I have a really good idea. We could combine that idea from this product and that idea from this product and it could do this and really think about what those ideas are. But also think about what are the things that concern you? What are the things that worry you? Because if you ask the developers at the end about those things that worry you, I think in a lot of cases, they can maybe help overcome some of those fears. So um, hopefully your emergency plans have a little more detail than this. Um, but I've come across a lot of clients whose emergency planning is limited to evacuation in the event of a fire. Um, and if, if they cover anything else, it's usually a list of contact numbers. So when I came across um, Andrew's product, Crisis Dojo, um, I was quite excited to see, see what it would do. And I had a little play with it. And it certainly seems to be going in the right direction. Um, so Andrew spotted this problem with, with um, emergency plans, and which is why he decided that maybe AI could provide a solution for that. Um, so um, particularly welcome, Andrew, today because he's dialing in from the U.S., um, I'm not quite sure what time it is, but I'm, we appreciate him working to our time scales. So I will stop sharing, Andrew, so you can have the screen. Brilliant. Um, thank you very much. And um, uh, you set the scene for a lot of stuff. I'm going to try and stay quite narrow because we've got other presenters and um, a limited amount of time. Um, and I apologize in advance. I'm going to jump around um, in order that I can show you everything because some of these things are a little bit difficult to fit in to 10 minutes. So I'm gonna share a video first and I'll explain um, what I'm doing uh, as we go through this. So this speaks to the planning part. Now Crisis Dojo and the, and the bigger tool is, 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 is a series of tools, but I wanted to, to start off a little bit referring back to what Bridget mentioned a moment ago about procedures. And when she and I chatted last week, she set me a little bit of a challenge uh, and I foolishly accepted. Um, and so what, um, the challenge essentially was, was before um, we 
start building anything, we need to understand what we are preparing for. And part of that is scenario based, but also a lot of the time it's regulatory based. I know nothing about Martin's law. And so could I, my challenge was, could I understand enough to start to prepare for that? And you'll see I'm using a real life uh, uh, scenario. So hopefully you can see the video and I will just give you an idea of what's going on here. Now this is chat GPT and we'll talk about narrow versus broad in a second. But hopefully this will give you some idea of what these tools can do for you right now. So whether you can read it, it's moving quite quickly, but essentially I started off by just saying, are you familiar with this? And it's given me some um, background. So that's a very broad um, uh, query. But of course, we know that these machines can make things up. So I thought, well, let's be a bit more specific. So I gave it the text of the bill and then asked it specifically, what are the measures that I need to implement? Now, this chat overall, this whole session took me about 20 minutes last night, so I've speeded it up here, but I asked it some very specific questions, and this is the difference between general and narrow. Even though this is a general tool, I'm now narrowing it by, I'll just pause it here, I'm now narrowing it in two ways. I'm giving it very specific questions and or prompts, and I'm giving it the document. And they're very good when you give it the document and say, what is in this document? They only return, if it's a well-trained model, they only return answers based on that document, which if you're familiar is more of a rag type situation. So again, you can go from general to narrow and get high quality, accurate results um, by focusing in. So I've gone through, uh, there's a lot of back and forth and then I've asked it to prepare a memo because I'm now thinking in a real life situation, I need something to work on. And I asked it to uh, convert this memo into a document that I can download. And so after about 10 or 15 minutes, um, I now end up with a downloadable document um, that gives me an outline of what's in this legislation. Now, exactly the same way that if I'd asked a junior associate to go and sum all this up, I'm not going to take this and immediately implement it without checking. I would then take this, I would read through the documentation and verify it and check it myself. But what it's done in about 10 or 15 minutes is give me, you know, the bare bones of what's involved in this uh, piece of legislation and what I need to do. So from a planning perspective, I now have an idea of the kind of planning that I need, the people I need to identify, exercises, the sort of the frequency of updates, et cetera, et cetera. So that saved me um, a significant amount of time. So then I thought, okay, what should we prepare for? Give me some likely scenarios. And again, you've probably done this already, uh, or you've maybe used it in this in this situation, uh, and it starts to give me um, some suggestions. And I've asked it to base it on real events that have happened in the UK. Uh, as Bridget said, I live in America. We have a very different type of crime uh, in America uh, than we do in the UK. So I'm specifically asking it to tell me about events in the UK. And just to pause it here, the first two or three are quite plausible and, and, and probably things that we all remember happening relatively recently. As we get into the bottom, active shooter, obviously much less common in the UK, very common here, sadly. Uh, CBRN, much more left field. It doesn't mean that we wouldn't prepare for it, but probably less likely. And so maybe not the first thing that we that we would do. So now it's given me a series of scenarios. I may disregard some of those, but the nice thing is that sometimes it gives me things that I haven't thought about. So it's prompting me to think in different ways. And then I thought, well, let's push the envelope a little bit and see what we can do. So I've given it a map. If you know Wandsworth, this is um, the, the mall in Wandsworth. Um, and I just dropped in the map. This is an image of the map. This is not GIS. And at this point, I didn't know what it was going to do. So this is a, as exciting for you as it is for me. So I asked it, could it give me some suggestions? And it gave me some quite good suggestions. Now, if I run um, the Southside Mall, I don't need someone to tell me that King George's Park is a great place to muster people potentially, or, or that the Wandle Recreation Center is a great place. But if I were working as a consultant somewhere else, or I've gone in to help a, 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 an office or somewhere that I'm not as familiar, this is now giving me very plausible, realistic answers that it has pulled from uh, the map. And again, one and two are reasonable. Number three, which it mentions all farthing lane isn't so good, but it's a, it's a reasonable guess just looking at the map. So quite pleased again with what it could do there. And then finally, I asked it about muster points. And you can see that this is real because it's full of typos. Um, and it gave me a couple of suggestions here about where emergency services and other things uh, can operate. What's really interesting is in a minute, you're going to see that it refers to two streets. And those streets are not named in that image that I gave it. And so what you're seeing now is the sort of incredible depth of knowledge 
that some of these models have. And so the two streets marked on arrows are the streets it references by name that are both very plausible uh, muster points for emergency services. But again, it is pulling this from a much deeper uh, corpus of data, but give me some very, very good suggestions. Now, we're not here today to, to plan uh, a, a set of procedures in preparation for the mall in, um, in Wandsworth. But hopefully that's given you a sense of, as I said, in, in 20 minutes, I was able to go pull uh, some uh, uh, general information by querying it, give it some very specific information uh, in, in the case of the bill, get it to summarize that and return that to me and then give me some scenarios and some other things to think about. So if we then um, move away from here and start to talk about um, actually planning, this is where um, the tool that I've built comes in. And this is this is a much more narrow um, focus. So now this is the decider workspace that hopefully you can all see. And there's a bunch of things in here, um, but we're just going to look at one of them today. So what I've tried to do is I've tried to build narrow tools to do specific jobs um, in order that, as Bridget had said, you know, sometimes if we if we rely on these to do something that they're not quite trained for, um, we might get um, quite an exciting answer. So we're going to come in here and build a crisis exercise. And so what this is going to do is this moves between um, very broad and very narrow. So right away, defining the organization is very narrow. Uh, and the reason for that is that I want to make sure that the machine really understands exactly what we are dealing with. But then as we go down to this point here, we're now relying on the very creative part of AI to generate ideas. I'm not going to do this now because I've actually got an idea that I pulled from that previous discussion. So I'm going to skip here and I'm just going to jump over and pull out um, pull out a scenario and that and this comes from the um, <clears throat> from the chat that we just that we just had. So this is um, So this is now giving it the scenario and we're going to start to prompt it again. So what you'll see is I'm deliberately moving between very narrow and very general. And what I found is that for this tool and for some much more complicated tools, this movement between the two gives us the best results. And as Bridget said, you know, going back to machine learning, machine learning does some things very well. Generative does some things very well. So I 100% I agree um, that we are not at the point when we have AGI yet. Um, and if we expect one tool to do everything, we're going to struggle. But at the same time, if we give it some very specific guidance, it's going to give us a good result. And so the images are a good um, are a good example. I could ask the AI to go and find me uh, a picture and say, find me a picture of people running for their lives. But if I type a search for run for your life, I might find people doing a charity run. And so I need to make sure that I'm giving it something that's very plausible. Otherwise, the whole thing um, will fall apart. And once I've pulled all this together, I can ask it to write the exercise. Now, this does take a few minutes. I'm going to set this running now, and it might uh, get done in the time. But if not, I'm going to jump to the end and show you what it produces. Uh, but ultimately, what I'm trying to do here is take all of the time it would normally take to build some kind of training exercise, which... Um, even a simple tabletop exercise was going to take you days to put together and compact it down. And this does it uh, in, a, in an hour or less. And so now we're sending these prompts to the model and using the very creative generative part to go and write some headlines, provide some social media, et cetera, et cetera. But within the narrow confines of we've given a location, we've given a type of event, et cetera, et cetera. So we're using um, broad creativity, but in a narrow field. And that's this sort of switching that we do um between the two and so maybe in a second we'll see this come out and then just i'm going to quick, jump quick question you. while we're waiting yes. andrew if that's okay yeah um just someone was just querying so is, you're using when you were using chat gpt i'm assuming that was the paid version four not the free version 3.5 um the one that you saw the video of yes i do have the paid version yeah um and this uh what you're seeing here uses uh currently it's it's different um, it's different models of chat of the open AI a, um, API, um, but some other parts of my app use different um, different models because different models give me better results for different for different yeah. things. So again, it's, it's it's sort of picking the right tool for the job. But yes, the initial chat. So I don't know what the limitations would be if it were 
the free version, unfortunately. So sorry if I sort of misled you. No, 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 that's fine. Um, I, I, I took that for granted, but I just wanted to make yeah. that clear because I think other people weren't weren't sure of the difference. But um, okay. but it was a suggestion that we have another session sometime on how do you prompt chat GPT properly to get better answers? So that's a topic for discussion, maybe another day. I might I might come and attend that one because it's a perennial it's a perennial problem. It's the um, PPP, PPP, I think, isn't it? <laughs> so. Um, very quickly, because um, I'm gonna, I want to show you what the outlook is, the outcome is. Um, you could write this yourself, and many of you will have written these yourself. This has just done it that little bit faster. I've got a headline, I've got a breaking news story, and I've got um, social media prompts. And then there's a big button down here that's going to make this do something. But while that is busy, um, what I want to show you quickly is what um, the final outcome is, because. Um, this is the whole point of it. So this is the training pack that you're going to get back if you use the tool. Um, and again, this is extremely rigid. This is a template. This is a Google slide template into which the model pushes all the information. Um, and the important thing here is that I didn't want to just send somebody a scenario. I wanted to send them guidance on how to run an exercise. So this video here for two minutes, if you've never run an exercise, tells you how to run an exercise. Then we go further down, it gives us a scenario, and then again, how to set up, and then later on, we actually get into the exercise itself. Once you get to this stage, this is very reminiscent of what you would normally see in a tabletop exercise, um, but again, it's being produced um, extremely, uh, extremely quickly. So that is that is what we're going to get in the end, and if I think I have one more minute, um, I should be able to show you the final video. And unfortunately, in the giant mess of screens that I have open, I have lost the video. But let me see if I can. There we go. As with all tech demos, it has failed at the final hurdle. Um, if um, if I'm able to later, what I will do is I'll drop a, a link into the chat and you're welcome um, to look at that. And But what it does is it then gives you a simulated news headline. So the the big takeaway is that this is not really about my tools so much as two things one hopefully give you an idea of what you can do with the the openly accessible tools like chat gpt but then two um how i found a great way to get really really good credible um consistent results by this toggling between the general part the very specific part focusing the prompts etc cetera, etc cetera. so hopefully um that will give you some ideas of how you may be able to chain these together use the right tool for the job and uh, and ultimately it's all about just sometimes making things faster uh, uh so that we can do our jobs a little bit more efficiently thank you bridget brilliant thank you very much that's really interesting yes yeah, and some some, uh, some good thoughts to share hopefully that's got a few people thinking about you know what they might be able to use a tool like that for how useful it would be um right so i'm just going to very quickly share one slide um so again, this is a problem I find in a lot of organizations. Um, they, they, they might not have very much crisis management organization, but they have folders and folders and folders of safety management information of manuals and procedures and risk assessments and so on. Um, quite often inconsistencies between them. So the risk assessment will identify a hazard that's not then covered in, the, in a procedure or method statement. Um, and we think that putting them all on SharePoint makes us high tech, but actually I think we've got worse um, at configuration management. I mean, back in the 1980s, I was taught how to do configuration management. Um, and nowadays I don't see any of that going on. So I was very excited to come across uh, Simon's product. Um, Simon had been involved in civil engineering, um, utilities, um, 30 years in that sort of industry. But he could see again and again that lessons were being lost, mistakes were being made. Um, and identified the benefits of AI as far ago as 2016 um, and with a little bit of support from the Welsh Government and the HSC as well as uh, support from companies in the construction sector and I think that speaks to the strength of the product that, that he got that support. Um, he developed Intuity which I won't tell you too much about but I will um, leave Simon to tell you more about it. Thank you Bridget, uh, a fantastic introduction, thank you. Um, <clears throat> So hopefully I am sharing my screen perfectly well. Thumbs up, Bridget. We're back to seeing two copies again. We had got around this before, hadn't we? Yeah, I've got a number of screens open similarly actually, which is a problem. 
Let me try one more time. Okay, we're, we're seeing the, um, oh, yeah, if you go into presentation mode. Yep, oh no, we're back to speaker mode. Oh yeah, then if you go up to the display settings and do your switch again. Ah, that's it, fabulous. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, so I've got an impressive um, presentation for Andrew to follow. So just re reiterating what Bridget mentioned, you know, so I'm a chat civil engineer, so I've come from an industry problem, looking for a solution, not not a, an academia spin out. And um, so I'll do today, I'll talk a little bit about um, how I believe AI is already complementing us as human beings um, and, and share my view, view on that and do a little bit of show and tell about the technology we've created in natural language understanding and um, supported by Carolyn and our success, customer success team. Yeah, I'll actually show you and walk you through the product a little bit so you can get a little bit of context of how, of how it supports. So just to share um, how I believe AI will support us all. Um, in my, in my you know, when I passed 50, I started getting a little bit, I suppose, sad and watching YouTube videos of Steve Jobs and things. And I guess that's where I am today. And there was this really, really famous video of Steve Jobs whereby um, an academic ha asks him around about, you know, the efficiency of locomotion of animals. And there was cats, dogs, birds, and all sorts of things. And human beings were really inefficient. And what one was a condor on a thermos, not flapping its wings, no energy. And this academic, super clever, said, what will a human being on a push bike look like? And then it went right up the scale. I think it may even beat the condor. And I thought it's an incredible analogy of how AI can support us all in our jobs in our various sectors. So I give an example. So... I could train every single day of the week and I'm not beating more thorough over 10,000 meters. However, I can go to Halfords, buy a hundred pound push bike, and all of a sudden I can beat him easily hands down for a simple hundred pound tool. And I see AI technology being exactly that for all of us in every daily life, as Bridget spoke about, or work environments where we get tools to enhance our ability to perform better than we could without the tool. So you know that's just an analogy where I think um, we 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 you know we, we're at as 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 a industry and society. So um, yeah, I'm going to keep this show and tell. So I'll just give a little bit of concept around um, what we've developed as a product over the last half a decade. You know, we were pre runners to to ChatGPT and things, and I'll explain where we we differentiate. So we've built um, our own large risk model. Um, which automatically learns and ingests every time it interacts with a user from a risk control mitigation perspective. And there are hundreds and hundreds of thousands of data points in, the, in, this, in this AI model. And the critical part of it, I guess, just to mention, you know, we'll, we'll linger on it too much, is it's relied upon information, um, which is really critical from us within, within the safety industry. So, um, I'll briefly show you, well, I will show you two of these products actually in action, in live, in the platform, and as Carolyn's going to support me on. For essentially, we've got a number of products, you know, we connect everybody, find anything, mitigate every hazard, and critically interpret data smartly in ways that you can't without the support of the technology we spoke about. Carolyn, as you're moving on, Carol, Carol, would be kind enough to share the first live view of the platform, please, if that's okay, if I stop sharing. Fantastic, brilliant, perfect, perfect. Thank you, Karen. More technically minded than myself, obviously. Um, so I've got an example of here. So this is this is our risk um risk assessment platform. So you'll upload your risk assessments or create them in the platform. It reads and extracts from any formish form of document you got, Word, PDF, Excel. Then it'll work its way through the document using this large risk model with intelligence, um, identify the activities that you've identified in your document, and then look for things from this intelligence platform that it believes you may have missed. And this is an example of a you know, construction of a new sewer pumping station. 
and it's identified activities or, or risks that you may have missed that you can then toggle them back and forth. You know, you accept or reject them. And once you accept them, then it will then provide the mitigations and controls for you to accept and reject. And it will work its way through the entire document, identifying things that have been missed, taken out of these hundreds of thousands of data points and making intelligent recommendations. Um, you know, and we, we, we have, you know, literally thousands and thousands of users now across predominantly the construction and water sector, because that's where we started. We're now moving out beyond that sector, you know, into airports and, you know, all, all sorts of, you know, adjacent industries at the moment. And we, you know, it, it, we've barely started in that space. But that information then is automatically injected directly into your native original document. So it becomes an efficiency process as, as, as you move along also as well then. Um, yeah, brilliant. Carolyn, could you move on to the next uh, next screen, please? Okay, so we spoke also about, um, about corporate memory and intelligence. So, you know, particularly the structural industry where I've come from, yeah, we are really brilliant. Yeah, when we have an incident, we'll do a deep dive analysis, root cause, we we'll do a lessons learned document, for example, we'll stand the business down and we all promise never ever to do it again. However, an hypothesis, not a theory, uh, that we've seen every incident thousands and thousands of times before. We just don't recall that hard earned industry know how and bring it back exactly where we want to. So our platform automatically ingests all your lessons learned, safe operating procedures, you know, near miss reports, whatever it may be, automatically ingest them. And then either through a natural language search, um, such as, you know, Carwin's put in here, you know, identify all the incidents around, arising around gas detectors. It will instantly read all your documents and go, ah, oh, yeah, two years ago, Bridget, you had an incident, you know, and here's your lessons learned. So it summarizes those. You can then read them. And if it's a document that you think is pertinent to what you were doing and you want to read it, you can click on the document and then it'll open up the original native document that was related to, to, to that incident. And, you know, it does that for your own specific corpus and knowledge library because, you know, that's your intellectual property. It brings your value to your organizations, but also does it for more generally publicly available documents such, such as the health and safety executive documents here. Um, and, and, and equally, it brings back these documents as well. And I, and I mentioned that it can do it without needing to search. So when you're reviewing your uh, and enhancing your risk assessments and method statements, if it's identified, for example, I don't know, you're excavating two meters deep in clay, it'll automatically bring these documents back for you to look, you know, so it uncovers and brings to the surface your safe operating procedures and the lessons learned previously. So you're not relearning them, same instance again, and, and, and driving behaviors in 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 the in the right direction. Um so yes, those are two of you know, two of the key features it also what's quality scores in the documents and, and, and all sorts of other clever stuff. But it, it's about enhancing um and you know I I I've referred to it as you know you know the corpus of knowledge is a way of one person review your risk assessment when you can have 10,000 people review your risk assessment. Yeah, it's this pool of knowledge that everybody can draw out of and, you know, and started the business and hopefully still still the aim. It, it's about, you know, leaving a legacy and, and changing the working environment which you work in and hopefully improving it. Thank you very much. Um, can you just, just clarify a little bit how that is different? Because I think, again, a bit like with Google Translate, where people think it's just looking up words in a dictionary. I guess with that previous example, you might think, well, I'll just go on to SharePoint and look for gas. Um, yeah. how, it's, how, is it, how is this different? What is it doing yeah. clever yeah. That, that, that's more than just searching on SharePoint for a keyword? Yeah, it's a really, really good question, actually, Bridget. Yeah, so I'll, I'll give you my civil engineering translation of AI technology for that perspective. So the branch of technology that we've we've um, advanced significantly in, you know, I believe we're right at the edge, um, is natural language understanding. So, if a computer or you any human being read the bow of a ship, you'll know it's the bow of a ship because bow and bow are spelled the same way because it's contextualized with the word ship. So we've had to teach the computer to understand that, build build ontologies and you know um, all sorts of taxonomies and things to support that process. And then say, for example, um, the 
computer read excavating two meters deep in clay. That gets turned into ones and zeros and sit, will sit somewhere in a three dimensional X, Y, and Z graph. But then the computer read excavating 10 meters deep in clay. Semantically, it's almost identical, but contextually, it's massively different in terms of the risk and exposure and so forth. So that'll get turned into ones and zeros and it'll sit somebody else, somewhere else in this X, Y, and Z graph. And what the computer, you know, there's various things we use transformers and all sorts of stuff, which is similar technology, you know, lots of the large language models use. Um, we measure the distance between those two two points, and we can use that then to go and search into our graphical database to make the appropriate responses, which is looked for and found in those original native documents as well. So it's not look, it's absolutely not looking for words, it's a semantic natural language understanding and relevance to the activities taking place that allow us to give the appropriate responses. That's really helpful, Simon, because I think otherwise, because obviously if you do do that textual search, you end up with thousands of results and you're, you're, you're using the AI here to go, well, actually, these five are probably the most relevant rather than the thousands Abs of things that happen absolutely, the same yeah, Absolutely, yeah, and, yeah. and you know, it, 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 it's a natural language description as well. You don't have to, you know, it, I might say JCB, you might say 3CX, somebody else says three, Street Master, yeah. When somebody, when somebody says digging, somebody says excavating, it will contextualize that and make the search on those appropriate um, appropriate responses then. Brilliant. All right. Thank you very much. That's great. Um, Joe, jo, I'm kind of almost regretting now we didn't have entire sessions devoted to each of your products because I think we probably could have easily filled up a session. But I am conscious we do need to move on to the third product. So um, if, Simon, if uh, sorry, Scott is uh, is up and ready and prepared. Yeah. Um, um, Should I go ahead, Bridget? Um, Oh. There we go. Oh, we just might as well. We we did it for the others. We might as well yeah. show show what you look like. Um, so um, I think one of the one of the big differences with Protex AI is um, you know, Simon has thirty years of experience. Um, the the founders of uh, Protex AI um were in the Forbes under thirty list last year. So um, they weren't even born when um when Simon and uh, most of us started our, our working life. So Protex AI is a very, very young and very exciting company, um, started by two childhood friends, Dan Hobbs, who had a business degree from Dublin, um, and Kieran O'Mara, who studied electronic and computer engineering. Um, Dan was going to join us, but he's unable to. So he sent us his very able deputy, Scott, today, um, who previously worked with global enterprise companies, including Uniqlo, um, to implement critical business operations software. Um, I've put a CCTV camera there because that's really what it's based on. So whereas the two ones we're looking at before are about language, this is very much about images. Um, their clients include Marks and Spencers, Procter and Gamble, and Dublin Port. So you know this is already this is not futuristic. This is already in use. Um, so Scott, over to you. Thanks so much, Bridget. Hi everyone, nice to meet you. My name is Scott, as Bridget said. So uh, I actually work on our enterprise sales team for Protex here. Delighted to speak with you. Looking forward to a uh, conversation and questions uh, towards the end of the call. So what I'm gonna do is I'll take you through a brief uh, presentation and then really dive into the solution itself. Um, so if you're not aware, our objective of Protex AI is really to identify leading indicators or non-compliant behaviors before they actually lead to accidents. As Bridget mentioned, um, we work with the likes of Marks and Spencer, DHL, Procter and Gamble, even the likes of Tesla and Amazon, and we've been able to reduce workplace instances by up to 80%. How this works is that we utilize your existing CCTV network on your sites, and we train the AI model to understand the activities that are happening on that particular site. So here's an example of um, a vehicle person near miss, for example. Uh, and you can see that the solution is detecting what is happening or recognizes that there's a non-compliant event and is flagging it. So there are many different use cases that we have that the solution can, can work with, and I'll get into those a little bit later. This is probably a diagram you've seen many times over in different shapes and sizes, uh, but it's a really good way of explaining why we do what we do. So typically safety has been done on a, has been carried out on a very reactive basis. We typically wait for an accident to ha happen, look back in time, and then put corrective measure into place uh, in, in the hope that it works. What we do is that we um, give visibility across your sites on a 24 seven basis, really on the lower part of this, this triangle here. And given the size and complexity of the operations that happens on your sites, 
there's, you know, you can't be everywhere all at the same time. And that's really what we do. We want to be your eyes on a 24 seven basis uh, across your sites to identify when those non-compliant events occur so that we can stop clients even getting close to the top here where accidents is or worse can happen. At Protex, the idea or our objective really is to manage by the collective. It's not to single uh, individuals out. So it's not saying, Scott, you've done something wrong. Come up to the office and we'll have a talk about it. It's really to understand what is happening across the board on your sites in terms of behavior. Data privacy and security is one of our key pillars um, uh, of the company. So we're ISO 27001 compliant, we're GDPR compliant, uh, and all of the data is actually processed on your sites and no personal identifiable information is shared with the cloud. We purposely do not use facial recognition software, uh, and we even have a process called de-identification where we can partially blur out or completely blur out the individual that's captured as part of the event. This is a more complete list of the use cases that we can capture. Uh, we'll share these slides afterwards, um, so you'll definitely have an opportunity to go through them yourselves. But the main uh, activities that we would see are things like slips, trips, and falls, um, non-compliance around PPE equipment, maybe uh, mobile phone usage, near misses, uh, exclusion zones, a lot of different activities. This list is ever-growing given um, the clients that we work with and which is a fantastic kind of byproduct of the relationship that we have with them is that our solution is continuously building out to make sure that it's the most proactive safety tool out there. Back to you, Bridget. Thanks, Mel. Brilliant. Thank you very much. That's a, as you say, whistle stop tour, but um, you know, quite quite. I think the the the, the visual AI, I mean, the textual stuff is so important, but the visual AI, I think, is the one where you kind of look at it and go. Wow, you know, it's like, I mean, I know Google Translate is clever and I know my Netflix and Amazon suggestions are clever, but when it can pick out my photographs, it somehow feels like a really special thing for it to be able to do. And I think the same with the video is that, um, I mean, I was reading my, my book on AI from the 1980s is talking about how do you recognize when a cylinder is in front of a cube? And, and that was where we were. And, and it seemed like we had 25, 30 years where we never really dealt with that problem and then suddenly there's this explosion in the ability to be able to discern images and identify images and i think there's so many other opportunities for, for development on that one um do we have any questions i can't actually see that we've got any questions in the chat which is i think that will stunned into silence does any, any if, if anybody wants to just call out any questions they've got if they um haven't got any other thoughts otherwise i've got a couple of Perhaps the developers have questions of each other. Andrew and Simon, have you got any questions for Scott, for example, or vice versa? There's lots running through my mind, Bridget, because this, uh, like you mentioned, yeah, there's lots of um, <clears throat> synergy in terms of complementary synergy. Um, it'd be interesting actually to build a few conversations because, yeah, this is about enhancement. Um, and they all could, you know, they, they mesh together like lots of other products quite nicely. So it'd be Absolutely. good to extend a few of these conversations after this meeting. You know, it's a brilliant introduction. Thank you. Excellent. Good. Good. Yeah. No, I'm I'm, I'm pleased about that because I think I do think that they're they're all quite complementary because they're all tackling different things. Um, I mean, the thing, the, the kind of issues I wanted to come back to again with these challenges. Now, I think Scott gave us a really good example of where this whole issue of privacy, because as soon as we start talking about using CCTV. Clearly, we're concerned about privacy. And I think there's a lot more on the Protex AI website. I know because I wrote some of it um, about this issue of how you use the tool, because if you use Protex AI to go, Jake, why did you do that? Right. Then that's not the way to you. If you kind of use that to go, OK, in this area, we've had a problem recently with more near misses. Is it because we put more pressure on you? Is it because we've got more deliveries coming in? Is it, you know, what what is it that we're doing about your human factors, your environment that's making life harder for you, that's causing these problems? And that's how we need to be using it. Jake, I, I picked on you because I know you've got a question. Question slash maybe something to think about for uh, for, for another session. I've, I've got to drop off at two, so I can't stay on. But one, one point that strikes me, I think the the the, the each to speak is so absolutely fascinating. Um, I am aware of Protex, and I think I, I probably only know about five percent of what the uh, what the the application is and the system's capable of. But one thing that strikes me is it's going to generate a lot of information, and I, I'm sure there are clever ways to disseminate. Um, but I guess at some level, businesses will have to um, spend time and resource looking at that that, that data. 
um, to make best use of it. And I wonder if there's a potential in the next kind of five years, collaboration on the back end of such a system as what Pro Protex can, can make available to then almost disseminate to what you were saying, Bridget, you kind of got in before me to say, yeah, wouldn't it be amazing if, if a, a team leader on a particular shift within a, within a warehouse was given some form of summary that took the, the output of Protex to then suggest some um, deep dive questions to get to the root cause of why these things might be happening? That would be the uh, w w without a safety professional going in and you know, looking at it and saying, oh, look, here's your trend here and that. I think that would be a natural build. I don't know if that is uh, possible at the moment, but I'm almost in my mind exploring ways that we could be efficient with the um, large amounts of data that are being used to try and make a big difference. Uh, more of a point for the call to reflect on rather than. Yeah, I think that's really. I think discuss. that's a really exciting idea, as you say, because it, it is it's it, you know, we have these systems, the more data they generate, how do we make use of them and actually having um, something that can look at the outputs and then turn that into something as a sort of an actionable thing for, for, for people and for supervisors and so on. Really good point. Uh, Scott, did you have any thought on that? Yeah, just wanted to add this. Actually, I wish I could have showed it to you, but uh, it's not part of the demo system as of yet. But we have exactly that, Jake. So it essentially consolidates the insights based on the relevance, the priority and the location, for example. Um, so it's a new feature on the platform that we're launching because inevitably some of the clients that we work with have hundreds, if not thousands of sites with hundreds, if not thousands of cameras. And inevitably they're going to be... Um, you know, a bit of a, a data overwhelming sometimes. So what we, we've developed a new aspect to our product that consolidates that based on um, urgency, priority, and, and relevance to the user or the site. Brilliant, okay. Um, yeah, I mean, the other the other sort of um, concerns and challenges, I think, are to do with um, uh, sort of the equity and the social impacts of it. And I think we've, we've already touched a little bit on the social impacts. Alan, you've got a question. Thanks, Bridget. Um, yeah, it, I mean, it's, it's, it's looking at how we bring all these things together. Um, I mean, absolutely fascinating session. And, and, and thanks to all the speakers, yourself included, too. It's added so much to my knowledge, a bit too late in the date for me personally. But um, I, I, I'm dealing with a similar issue with um, autonomous machines working in uh, open fields and so on in the agricultural environment. And one of the challenges is integrating all the various sensors and so on and the distance, different systems um, that are needed. And um, I, I just wondered, you know, how close are we or have I missed the point in these systems? How close are we to going literally, well, I can say the workplace place, but I actually mean a work piece, you know, actually working on, on a tool, as it were, right through to the board to assist that whole process in decision making identification of hazards, etc. And I know, you know, both the last two sessions uh, speakers touched on that. Yeah, I think Simon, your your product's probably most focused on 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 helping people to identify hazards, isn't it? I guess. Yeah, it is fundamentally what what we're about to do, and I'm building on the previous um, comment as well. You know about you know bringing the information from what's been identified by ProTech and actually producing the report. Um, you know, I, I you know I can definitely see an enhancement from both products in that in that space, mm -hmm. very much what has been discussed here, yeah. taking all that, you know, vector data, as it's called, yeah, and, and, and turn it into a, a meaningful output. Yeah, no, it's really interesting. I, th I th think that's the direction we are, we are heading, the direction of travel. And I think then the other aspect, the, the other end of your system, Simon, is if your part of your risk assessment then says, well, if it all goes tits up, we need to have a plan of what we're going to do. That's when Andrew's system then can Absolutely. come in and go, right, this is the plan for how we then deal with, with it at that end. So, yeah. um, yeah. It's, it's trying to understand that whole journey, isn't it? I think the thing is, and that's why I put this little diagram up, um, is because to me, and I know we'll, people will be dropping off soon, this human in the loop model is the really critical part of all of this, that all of these opportunities have to be reined in by the human in the loop. And so although I think it's great that we get some sort of interoperability between these systems that they can all work together, what we don't want is the the ai taking pictures at one end and then at the other end a redundancy notice comes out to somebody you know it we we have to have people in the loop who are going actually 
this is the information the CCTV cameras are, are telling us. Does it make sense? OK, it does. Let's feed that into the risk assessment process. What's the risk assessment process telling it? Right. Well, what's coming out of that? Does that make sense? Let's feed that into the emergency planning process. What's coming out of that? Does that make sense? OK, let's run that as a practical exercise for people to, to do the emergency um, exercise. And there has to be at all of those stages a human in the loop making those decisions. What we mustn't ever have is the AI having its finger on the red button. You know, we need to be the human in the loop. And that's why it's, I'm really grateful for so many people coming today because clearly you want to make sure you've got the skills to be in the loop. So hopefully this is only part of that learning journey. You know, this is this is hopefully giving you lots of ideas. Go and have a look at the Intuity website, the Protex website. Um, Andrew, is it D DCDR now, Decider? Yeah, sorry, it's got a bit out of control. Uh, yeah, DCDR.io no, is um, where everything works. Yeah. Um, but we will, we will on the um, when we when the information and the video goes up, there'll also be um, some slide packs there as well. So I've got the ones from Protex already. So if the other two can send me their slide packs as well. We can make sure they go up on there. So you'll have lots more information. But there's loads more products out there. So keep looking. Um, if you want to talk to me about it via LinkedIn, then please connect. But if you do make a connection request, tell me why, because otherwise I ignore you if you don't put a note on it. Um, and um, yeah, and let's keep on talking about this because I think it's 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 happening. So let's let's go with it and be there and make sure we're we're in control of it. Thank you.